Hi, this is Durgan Rasmus, and welcome to the Provocative Hypnosis Vlog. This particular episode is about the dark side and the potential huge trap there is in applying the perception is projection frame in an attempt to own your own stuff and evolve as a human being. Now, before we go there, I want to talk about some of the huge costs that can occur upon us by not seeing it. So let me be clear. Everything you experience, everything you see, hear, smell, feel, touch, is the end result of a thought process. Now, not seeing that has resulted in a lot of horror. A great example of this is the tragedy that happened at Charlie Hebdo. So a few years ago, pretty much the entire uh, workforce at Charlie Hebdo in France was wiped out by a couple of jihadists. And their reasoning for doing so was that uh, the guys at Charlie Hebdo had made a caricature drawing of the Prophet Muhammad. And these people felt so offended and they, they did the slayings to avenge the Prophet. Now, they even, they even screamed Allahu Akbar, you know, a after having done it uh, on, on the streets of France. Now, in their mind, it seemed as if the rage and, and, and the hatred that drove them to do such a heinous thing came from the drawings and the character drawings, as in because of this particular caricature drawing, I have these feelings of rage. But the, the blasphemy, the, the thought crime, so to speak, is not inherent in the, the paper or, or the lines of paper. It's inherent in the thinking process of the person who's making the projection. So if, if you were to take that exact same drawing and show it to a, a drunk at the local rough bar who may have no interest in religions or politics or, or ideology, he, he may just look at you and say, hey, thanks, you know, I could, I, I could set my beer on that. You know, that's, that's useful. And he, he might have a, a slight feeling of gratitude for you handing him the drawing. Because that's his experience. That, that's the value that he projects onto the drawing. If you were to show the, the exact same drawing or the exact same lines of paper, so to speak, to a, a, a bunch of nine-year-old kids in mathematics class, you know, some of them might go, ooh, we, we could create a, a, a paper airplane of, of that and, and use it to, as, as a prank against the boring teacher. So that slight sense of, of having fun doing a little prank would be their experience because that's kind of the qualities or the meaning that they attribute to it. Had you given it to me, who's, who's, whose political preferences are strongly libertarian and is very concerned with liberty and freedom of speech and stuff like that, I would have said, yes! I'm with you, I'll, I'll repost it, I'll, I'll stand with you. Make more, freedom of speech has to win. So I would have been accelerated and, and, and felt that I was uh, alongside them fighting the good fight for the right values. Because that's the meaning that I attribute to the, to the drawing. If, if you were to give this to a, a, a person whose political preferences are very different, uh, that person might go to the police and attempt to get you charged and convicted for a hate crime and call you a horrible racist, an is Islamophobe. Um, of course, Islam isn't a race, right? But, but a lot of people can't make those such a distinctions. Um, so, so he would likely have felt very offended and, and, and angry. 
Uh, and, and if you were to give it to the jihadist, you know, he, he might try to shoot you or chop your head off. Because cause the, the whole crime of blasphemy is, is what he projects on the drawing. Now, it's, it's very clear that the same lines on paper can't be the source of all these different experiences in different human beings. It has to mean that we're all experiencing our own mind. We're all experiencing whatever meaning the thought process inside of us projects onto it. And that's, that's the felt experience or, or, or the experiential reality that we live in. Now, you could say, who's right? Well, none of us ultimately so i i would claim that there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the particular values that i hold have more of a scientific basis and and have more of a humane basis in that the societies that have had more social and economic freedom the freedom of speech and stuff like that are more humane more peaceful and function better than theocratic societies. It's hard to argue against that with any sort of reality testing. But notions such, a, such as freedom of speech or property rights or the individual are also thought-created projections. They really have no existence outside of that. So, so ultimately, Ultimately, it's, it's all an expression of consciousness. It's, it's all an expression of, of thought. Now, imagine if the people who slayed the caricature drawers, uh, the artists at Charlie Hebdo, were to see that. I imagine if it no longer looked as if there was something out there that generated the feelings in them. You know, the, the notion to kill someone because of lines on a paper would in all likelihood dissolve. If, if they were to suddenly see that, wait a minute, the, the, this is lines on paper, and not even that, but we can kind of agree upon that, uh, that, that, that the blasphemy and the uh, all the bad qualities that I attribute to the people who made the drawing is a projection of my own thought process and generated by that very thought process. If, if that was seen, then the likelihood of anyone killing anyone else based upon an opinion or, or, or based upon a, a particular drawing would, would probably be close to zero percent. Like, it, it would no longer make sense. So if you, if, 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 if you can apply that to yourself and, and, and to kind of see that, that, you know, other people to me are who I think they are. Like, it's who I think this particular person is. That's the only thing that person can ever be to me. But to simultaneously see that whoever I think this person is, is not actually who they are. So, so the, the courageous uh, you know, champion for liberty exists in my mind. The, the hateful racist exists in that other mind. The infidel exists in a third mind, so to speak. And, and in that sense, is created by the thought that thinks it up. So, being able to, to, to work on your own projections is, is such a valuable tool. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple of more interesting examples before I go over to how you can trip yourself up by using this particular frame. I worked with a young man who was gay, who was about to get married, and who had a lot of turmoil. 
around some family members who were Christian and, and, and who, who, who wouldn't respect his, his decision to, to get married. And, and who were trying to convince him that, that homosexuality was, was a choice uh, or, or a disease and something that you could, could, could get therapy for. Now, that was not why he was in my office. He was in my office due to having a lot of, lot of anger issues. But he, he projected onto these particular family members qualities of being uh, intolerant and disrespectful and, and, and even evil. So w w one of the demands that he had was I need for them to respect my sexual orientation. Like I, I need for them to see what I see, you know? And if they don't see that, they're horrible human beings. Now, what I suggested to him was that I suggested to, them, to him, let's separate uh, legalities from a psychological experience. So in the legal sense, they have to respect your decision as an adult in Norway because gay marriage is legal. And for what it's worth, given my particular values, I, I completely agree with you. But at the psychological level, whose business is it? Who and what you respect? Well, that, that was his business. Now, if you're gonna grant that, well, psychologically, whose business is it who or what these family members respect. Well, that's, that's their business. So I suggested to him, I, I had him explore whether it was really true that he needed their approval or whether, or, or whether he merely wanted it. And being able to make that distinction was extremely huge. And I said to him, look, it's still up to you whether you invite them or whether you have contact with them or, or on what terms. You, you're, you're at liberty to, to decide these things for yourself. But just notice that whenever you point the finger outwards, there's always three fingers pointing back. So let's turn this around. You know, and this is inspired by the work of Byron Katie that, that some, people, some of you may recognize, but. Let's, let's turn this around. So, so the idea that they need to respect me, well, let's turn it around. A, they don't have to respect me. Meaning, or they don't have to respect my sexual orientation. And, and he was able to see that there was an element of truth in that, in that demanding that someone respect something psychologically is a bit like demanding that it stop raining outside when it's actually raining. They, they shouldn't respect it because they don't. That seems to be a more valid statement. How about uh, I should respect me? Meaning, respecting me and having the proper boundaries and seeing where my own experience is coming from, that's on me. It's not really up to them. Right, and, and the third one, you know, I should respect them. And he looked at me and he was like, and I said, dude, if you're psychologically demanding that someone has to see what you do and, and has to understand what you understand, um, at that point, you're not respecting their right to decide for themselves what they actually respect and what they actually don't. So using these sorts of turnarounds uh, is a wonderful opportunity to enlarge in perspective, own your projections, and experience the opposite of what you believe. I remember once, I, I've done this a lot in my own life because I project all sorts of crappy stuff. And I remember dealing with this super bureaucrat who, who, who seemed extremely stupid and, and unable to think for himself. And I was like, ow, oh, that fucking idiot, right? So I said, okay, let's own this stuff as my own. So the, the idea that, that he's a fucking idiot, well, I'm a fucking idiot. Or my thinking's fucking idiotic. How is it fucking idiotic? Well, I'm demanding psychologically 
that a person who doesn't seem to have much capacity for self-reflection or independent thought has to be reflective or show independent thought. That seems to go against the evidence. That seems to be pretty stupid thinking. Furthermore, I'm holding his alleged stupidity responsible for my own internal states and going around ruminating about it. Yeah, that's some pretty stupid thinking too. By doing that, I was able to get some perspective and get some of my sense of humor back. Now, as, as great as this stuff is, there is a huge potential trap in viewing everything as a projection and trying to own everything as your own projection. Let me give you an, an example from my, from my life. So one of my very early NLP trainers was a guy by the name of Tad James who taught NLP and hypnosis, and, and he also was into some spiritual stuff, you know, the ancient Hawaiian Huna. And I, I was part of a master trainer program at the time. And, and, and I noticed that when he spoke to us who were unpaid assistants, right? He, he would start the day by telling stories of, of this guy who worked in a moving company and he found this dollar on the ground and he'd been debating with, his, with himself all day whether to tell his boss or not. And then he finally did and the boss told him, well, I'm glad you did that because if you didn't, I would have to fire you. And, you know, these sorts of stories, you know, went and how his mother had died during the training and he couldn't go to the funeral because he had a fucking job to do and he expected the same commitment of us. Now, keep in mind, we were unpaid volunteers. So these kind of hardcore stories, you know, kind of came for an hour or hour, hour and a half. And then when the paid, the, the, the people who came to be trainers came, you know, he would met them, meet them and say, you know, you are the light and, you know, have this very spiritual um, uh, orientation. And we're thinking, this is, th th this is a bit weird. Th this is a bit strange. Now, of course, that is, that is my projection, right? Uh, and then, at that time, Tad James had taken RichardBanter.com and JohnGrinder.com and registers those domains as his. So if you were to search for Richard Bander or JohnGrinder.com at the time, you'd be sent directly to Tad James's website. Now, at this time, John Grinder had issued a, a statement on the internet about this, and, and there was this campaign of people trying to, to get Tad James to return the sites, right? I, I saw this just before I went on the plane to, to, to catch the training. And I remember during that particular, being part of the master training group, uh, there was a lot of talk about honesty and integrity and commitment and that sort of stuff from Tad James. I also noticed that he seemed to take quite a bit of credit for inventing stuff that uh, were probably not his inventions. And I, I reached a point. Now, here, here's, here's the relevance. During this training, he would, uh, he not only had taken these domains, uh, but I was the only person who in public, in front of the others, confronted him with this. So, so, so I said to him, you know, Tad, and this was during the master training meeting, I, I said to him, uh, given all this talk about honesty and integrity, I, I read this thing on the internet that you've taken these domains and, you know, people want them back. How, how does that map onto... And, and he looked at me and he said, well, we... First of all, it was my son, not me, so he kind of blamed his son, but it's still his company. And he said, we, we did it so that John Grinder, the barber in Arizona, uh, wouldn't take them, you know, for, for protective reasons. And I didn't buy that, so, so I, I kind of pushed him a bit based upon what he had said about Grinder and Mather, you know, during the course. And, and finally he looked at me and he said, in business it's use it or lose it, motherfucker. 
And I said to him, that, that I can't believe, right? But I think that sort of behavior is unethical pretty much anywhere. You know, theft, deception, uh, the, the, these are clear deceptive behaviors. But at, at the training, Tad would very heavily push the, you know, perception is projection frame. So that if you were to see anything in his behavior that was anything else than, than love and light, that just meant that you had another training to attend to. You know, you had some more work to do on yourself. Now, the, the way this was framed, it, it was framed in such a way that people started going out of their way to just saying, excellent, that's wonderful, that's perfect, a lot of the time. Because the, the more you claim to only see love and light and perfection and excellence everywhere, the more evolved that means that you are per definition because that's your projection. And it seemed to become this sort of silly game where, where people would go around talking like that, but, but where only one person out of all those people in public confronted Tad James with that particular behavior, and that was me. Even though a lot of people were kind of gossiping about it in, in private. So, so here you have all these people who are supposed to be psychologically evolved and sophisticated and go around saying that's perfect and, and that's excellent and, and that's fantastic all the time, but not a single person, while exposed to blatant hypocrisy and deception, calls out the person who's actually doing the deception. Because according to the frame, even seeing that or acknowledging that kind of implies that you're not quite as evolved as, as you could be. Now, there's, now of, of, of course, there, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong in, it, in this particular case of saying, you know, have I ever been deceptive? Or may I have my own ulterior motives in, in confronting it, you know? May this be an element of virtue signaling on my part, and so on and so forth. Um, but here's, here's the trap. It, the, 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 there's, there's not a trap in perceptionist projection per se, but given that we all have a tendency to be the hero in our own story, and, and, and that we have, to, we have a tendency to project things onto stuff that kind of reinforces how we want to see ourselves, you, you can very easily kind of stunt your own growth and evolution as a human being by playing this game because what you can end up doing is that you can end up deceiving yourself in such a way that you, you no longer quite acknowledge the, the hypocrisy or the lies or the deception. Because doing that kind of implies that, that you're not as loving or, or whatever you want to be, you know. Um, so make sure when you do shadow work and when you work on projections that, you're, that it's a, 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 a ruthless quest for truth, so to speak. And you're going to trip yourself up because we, we human beings are strange creatures with many competing commitments. But you can, you can very easily trip yourself up by using this frame. Now, here's also something else. There are people out there and I'm, who have strong psychopathic and narcissistic tendencies. These people do exist. I'm not implying, by the way, that Tad James is one of those. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that he is, right? Uh, but there are people in this world who have strong psychopathic and narcissistic tendencies. There, there, there are literally people with no conscience whatsoever. Now, of course, 
the label narcissist and psychopath is is dramatically overused because many of us have a tendency to project it onto people who think differently than we do or who we might not quite understand or whose basic personality orientations we may just not vibe with you know if i could have a dime for every spouse who calls their ex-husband or wife a psychopath or a narcissist i'd literally be very rich you know not that rich but but quite quite <laughs> You, you kind of get the analogy. Now, if you if if you deal with someone in this world who who are extremely narcissistic or extremely psychopathic, uh, of course we all have these tendencies to various degrees. So it's extremely useful to look for the narcissist and to look for the psychopath. In yourself and, and, and to see those tendencies in yourself and to own them but to to stop there and 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 to then kind of play this game where ah uh, if, if if I can't just see love and light in this other person then that's time for me to do more shadow work you might end up getting duped tricked, abused, hurt, maimed, or even killed. If you look at spiritual communities, th there is no shortage of leaders. And if you look at politics too, th th there's no shortage of leaders with high psychopathic and narcissistic tendencies who often get to, abu get to abuse their power, so to speak, because so many people enable them and because so many people think it be not spiritual or not kind to see those tendencies in them and, and to call them out for it. So be aware of that. If, if, if you're going to do shadow work and own your projections, I, I really urge you to... Uh, read up on narcissism read up on psychopathy read up on these cluster b personality tendencies so even if you own it in yourself and see it in yourself uh from time to time you you, you may want to acknowledge that some people literally don't have a conscience or um, will deceive you dupe you take advantage of you abuse you or, or even kill you if, if, if they get the, uh, the opportunity. So um, again, I, I hope this video was informative. I, I hope it was useful. Um, I, I had a little debate with myself whether to name Tad James. I did so in my 2015 Provocative Suggestions book. I, I landed on it being right to do so because if, if, if I just talk about a generic NLP teacher, it's, 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 it's kind of a way of, of uh, sp spreading the suspicion around of who it could be. So I think it's more fair and more honest to just point directly uh, to the person. And then, of course, do with this whatever you want. Anyways, I hope, I hope this was useful, thought-provoking. Uh, if you have any comments, questions, feel free to post them wherever you find the video. Uh, if, if you like my way of thinking and, and working and you're curious about sessions or mentoring or hosting me for a seminar, uh, contact me through provocativehypnosis.com. Until next time, thanks.